is so risky. Try to make a living with art. But Jordy was compelled to create. Jordy was always chill. I've never seen her upset. But towards the end, you could see the darker stuff come out. When she didn't show up, her mother knew something was wrong. It was enough to drive her to file a missing persons report. I actually located a steak knife in the bushes. I just remember thinking, holy crap. We want to talk to you about it, get your side of everything. We were just horrified something like this could happen to somebody like Jordy. Once I made the connection with the glasses being hers, I started thinking that there's a lot more to this than just a missing person. Your fear is you're not going to find her alive. Spring 2016, St. Augustine, Florida. A picturesque seaside town with a thriving art community. Jordy Hudson is in her element, fresh off a successful art show. She stood out from everybody else. She was always into what her passion was, art. Me liking art and her being an artist, I kind of looked up to Jordy. Always nice, genuine person. Way chill, way mellow. Her work was different than most anything I'd ever seen. It was very visceral. Jordy put her heart and soul into it. It was real and it was genuine and, um, and, and original. Jordy came from a family of artists and from an early age had a strong persona. She was just one of those people that just was very confrontational. It was evident in her personality, it was evident in her art. She was tattooed, she was real punk looking. She was always on the fringe. She was always out to make a statement. A leader, you know, never a follower. In 1985, at just 15 years old, Jordy attends the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. After that, the School of the Museum of Arts in Boston. And by her early 20s, her art is exhibited in galleries across the country. It is so risky uh, to try to make a living with art. But Jordy was compelled to create. But Jordy's success is not without its struggles. Jordy had meningitis, and possibly as far back as her college days, she had issues of lightheadedness. She had some serious muscular problems to the point where she literally could not walk or talk. Jordy was sick for a long time. I knew that she was on some type of medication. In 2012, when Jordy is 42, she moves from Milledgeville, Georgia, to an apartment in St. Augustine, Florida, to be closer to her mother, Judy. Jordy's mother was a big support for her. Her mother was her caretaker, um, driving her around and handling her medications, which were numerous. St. Augustine turns out to be the perfect place for Jordy to continue working on her art. It literally is an artist's hangout. It has quite a vibe to it. St. Augustine's always been a pretty artsy town. Way back when, there was a kind of a, a big hippie scene. In late summer 2012, Jordy's success hits a setback after her health takes a near fatal turn. She could not speak that clearly. She talked about having had dizzy spells. She was having to use a cane at some point. So she was having a very difficult time with this meningitis. Her illness brought out some rawness, some, some real heart, real emotion in her artwork. She put her illness into her work. You could see the darker stuff come out, and it, it stuck out. And I believe that's because of her illness. Jordy only mentioned her illness one or two times throughout the time I knew her. She wouldn't let that hold her down. I just think that her having this fatal disease couldn't help but influence her. I own a gallery called Space 8 here in St. Augustine, and I gave Jordy her show in 2012. That whole exhibition was under the context of her dying soon, like very soon. In advance of the show, we always get media coverage, and at the time, there's a publication called Folio Magazine. They were sent to cover her and talk about her art. Very first meeting, 
Jordy was one of those people that was memorable in so many ways. I photographed Jordy at her studio. She was in bad shape. They're not pleasant, happy photos. She was in a difficult time of her life, so we tried to reflect that. This cover shot, I didn't direct her. She was so good in front of the camera, and she would just bare her soul to me. She was a dream subject. Somebody that wears their feelings on their sleeve out for all to see. She had a, a teardrop tattoo under one eye. That was the only tear that could come out of that eye because she had no more, no more tear duct. Uh, just sad. It's so striking that it was hard to take a photo that didn't mean something when you take a photo of Jordy. She was a very genuine and heartfelt person. When I was leaving, she she said she wanted to give me a gift. She insisted that I take this uh, medallion and uh, do treasure it still. This issue of Folio Weekly is released in November 2012. Jordy's friends and family believe this will be her final art show. Because we got so much press and because the story was so unique and compelling, it, it drew a big crowd. People were very excited about it. She was literally on her deathbed leading up to the show, you know, during the exhibition. And I think it was just really emotional for her to get the acknowledgement for her art, not at her, you know, illness. And soon, perhaps motivated by the show and the feature, Jordy's health improves. It had gone into remission. I remember being surprised. I'm being, you know, happy that she beat it. Over the years with Jordy, we would run into each other, would talk, and it's normally only about our art. Here's an artist who apparently was recovering, who was getting stronger. She was back on the upswing. She had that attitude that I'm totally comfortable with what we're doing, and she was great. Jordy was just thriving and creating art and in, in not letting her illness drive her. On Monday, April 11th, 2016, Jordy doesn't show up for her weekly visit with her mother, Judy. That causes Judy to become concerned. Jordy Hudson would stop by her mother's place on a regular basis to pick up a stipend for rent or for food. When she didn't show up, her mother knew something was wrong. When three days go by with no word from Jordy, Judy contacts the St. Augustine police. At first, we weren't really concerned. We get calls all the time. My wife didn't show back up home. She hasn't been home all weekend. And come Monday, she shows back up because she's, you know, been out partying. I wasn't sure if she was just hanging out at someone's house, never came home. But with these kind of investigations, we have to turn over every rock. We started looking at police reports and hospitals to locate Jordy. The day Judy reports Jordy missing, Sergeant Etheridge responds to an unrelated call at 88 Cedar Street in St. Augustine. The homeowner had called and said he had seen somebody's personal effects in his driveway, some blood on the sidewalk, and he wanted to make sure that nothing had occurred, that no one was hurt or injured. When I went up there, I started talking to the, the homeowner. He showed me a pair of glasses and where the blood drops were, they were right on the edge of the, out by the road on the driveway, close to the fence. Took, you know, some samples for evidence, just in case something came up of it um, at a later time. I went and collected the pair of glasses and then brought it back to the police department. When he returns, Sergeant Etheridge continues reviewing Jordy's case and makes a disturbing connection thanks to the photo of Jordy that Judy had given to the police department. The photo she provided had Jordy in dark frame glasses. I scrutinized the photos a little bit more. I was able to see the, the hinge on the glasses detailed, and I compared them to what I had in my hand. And 
It was a dead ringer for the glasses in her photo. Once I made the connection with the glasses being hers, I started thinking there's a lot more to this than just a missing person. We're thinking maybe she had gotten into a scuffle. Something like that had possibly occurred. Investigators worked to identify Jordy's final moments. I watched the video surveillance. I knew she was definitely with somebody that night, and that was our first break. Last time I saw her was when she walked out the door. No idea that would have been the last time. And using every tool in their arsenal, they focus on finding answers. There was video surveillance directly in the area where the blood was located. How did we get so lucky? It was when we showed her the picture, she realized that we knew what we were talking about and that she needed to fess up. The day Jordy Hudson is reported missing, detectives have discovered her glasses in the yard of a home in St. Augustine, Florida. Myself and Detective Watchcott went back out to 88 Cedar Street and started really doing a a lot of more detailed search. Not too long into the search, we discovered a large amount of blood in the bushes. There was a significant amount of blood. But it wasn't just uh, somebody tripped and fell. It was a lot of arterial spray on the bamboo, on the fence, and, you know, puddles of blood. There was enough blood that we realized something definitely bad had happened to Jordy. I was starting to look through the underbrush. As I was moving it apart with my hands, I actually located a, a steak knife in the bushes. I just remember thinking, holy crap. One of the first things that we did is we went to Jordy's house. I looked around to see you know, was there a struggle? Did something happen? Is furniture overturned to see if any items are missing? But nothing seemed out of place. As detectives are leaving Jordy's home, they run into her neighbor, Fred Stanley. While we were at Jordy Hudson's house, Fred Stanley was trying to get our attention. We walked out to him, started talking to him. We asked him, like, hey, when's the last time you've seen Miss Hudson? And he goes, well, we were at the Giggling Gator Bar the prior weekend, which was the 9th of April. She was supposed to show up at her mom's house the Monday after the time she was at the Giggling Gator, and she never showed up. That, in turn, led us to go to the Giggling Gator to try to get video that night of who she was talking with, who she might have left with, and just any information that could show us where she might be. Detectives head straight to the Giggling Gator, which is just half a mile from 88 Cedar Street, where police located Jordy's glasses and the knife the day after she went missing. The Giggling Gator is basically like a dive bar. We've been there for just various, you know, calls for service, fights, or whatever. I worked at the Gator off and on for about 12 years. We do get a lot of tourists, but at the end of the night, it's usually people we already know. The police, I was at work and they came in and said Jordy was missing. You feel worried and you wonder like, oh, you're, if they're safe or not. The next question is like, what's your involvement with Jordy? You know, I'm just a bartender and she's a patron. With any investigation, one of the first things we start looking for is video surveillance. And I personally knew the Giggling Gator had a lot of video surveillance from previous cases that I'd worked. The detectives are in luck. They're met with a treasure trove of video. They scroll back in time to Saturday, April 9th, hoping the video will shed light on Jordy that night. There was no audio with the video surveillance from the Giggling Gator. So we have to try and put our mind in interpreting what the video is telling us. The Giggling Gator was a little bit hectic. I noticed a couple of males that were in the back of the bar arguing. They continue scanning through the video second by second. At 1.36 a.m., they spot Jordy and she is wearing the glasses police found at 88 Cedar Street. I was 
working that night and she came in, she said hello, you know, first thing I asked, how you doing, what can I get you? You could tell that her spirit was up. Jordy was having a, a decent night, a good night. They also see Fred Stanley, her neighbor. I could see Jordy come into the bar and that Fred was following her in. They ended up hanging out, having a couple of shots. And after a while, it looked like they got into a verbal argument. And Jordy seemed very upset and agitated. You're just trying to figure out what was the incident between Mr. Stanley and Jordy? It kind of looked like Fred was trying to get her to leave, and she didn't want to go. Eventually, Fred left the bar, and Jordy stayed and continued to have a couple more shots. The argument caught on video leads detectives to wonder whether Jordy's neighbor, Fred Stanley, may be responsible for her disappearance. We watch Fred leave the bar and walk down the street. He it was never in any of the other video surveillance that would indicate he came back to do anything to Jordy. By looking at the video, you can eliminate people or you can include people. And in this case, with Mr. Stanley, it excluded him. Jose tells investigators he didn't notice anything unusual inside the bar that night. I remember actually taking a break. I'll have a cigarette. Jordy explained her new pieces and stuff. She she did mention, like, some of my stuff could be dark. She asked questions like, are, are you into that type of uh, work? And I told her, I'm, I'm very open-minded. Just have to see it and see if I like it or not. So I remember when I said that, she smiled and she said, uh, that's cool. Maybe you should come check out my new work. That's when I agreed to do it. You know, like, okay. Jose doesn't know that these will be his final moments with his friend. Last time I saw her was when she walked out the door. I just remember her saying, I'm going to go hang out with some people. I expected to see her later on that week. No idea that would have been the last time. As the detectives continue watching surveillance footage, something catches their eyes. We saw the outside surveillance cameras, a large male and a couple other guys taking their shirts off like they were going to fight. I remember there was an altercation. There was an incident with two guys outside that I had to take care of. The bigger guy, I remember grabbing him and, you know, giving him a bear hug and trying to pull him back. He was a little bit bigger than me. Intimidating. You know, the tattoos, the size of him. Was the first time and last time I saw that guy. The large male was covered in tattoos, almost a big giant sword, and head tattoos. After that fight kind of dispersed, is when you see Jordy walk outside and begin conversing with this large white male with the tattoos. They didn't seem like they were having issues, Jordy and and the male. We noticed. Two of the males walk off with her. The glasses were on her face when she left the bar at 3 o'clock in the morning. And then as of Monday morning, those glasses were in the driveway next to a, you know, blood. Whoever the men seen walking off with Jordy are, they are now suspects in her disappearance. I knew she was definitely with somebody that night, that something had happened, and that was our first break. Your fear is you're not going to find her alive. On April 15th, 2016, a day after Jordy Hudson's mother reported her missing, Investigators have found surveillance video of her leaving the Giggling Gator bar with two unidentified men. We saw the outside surveillance cameras and we saw her leaving with those two individuals. Watching the video surveillance, I knew Jordy, but nobody else had a name. I had no clue how we were going to figure that out. It's during the time that I'm watching the video surveillance 
that one of the bartenders says he recognizes one of the males and knows his name, Trinity Boinkin. Trinity had gotten into the fight with the man that Jordy had left with. Trinity was not a suspect only because we saw Trinity leave and he didn't leave with Jordy. So when the bartender told me that he knew Trinity Boinkin from the video surveillance, that was my first clue that, okay, maybe he can have some other names for the other subjects. My goal at that point was to get him in to talk to him. When I ran Trinity through our police database, I had his information, his telephone number. Detective Ochkai contacts Trinity and asks him to come in the following day for an interview. So when Trinity comes in for the interview, we told him, you're possibly a witness and we just want to know the information that you know. He tells me that he had a history with Harry, which was the guy's name that he gave us. Trinity does not know Harry's last name. He tells me that they ended up arguing over an ex of Harry's that Trinity was now friends with. Trinity didn't like the way that Harry had treated her. And so it came to blows outside. But he says, you know, I left and I haven't seen Harry since. So at that point, we just start figuring out a way we can find Harry. This is somebody that we needed to track down and talk to. As they work on identifying Harry, investigators are also trying to learn more about Jordy's movements on the night she disappeared. At this point, we decide to look to see if we could find more video surveillance of Jordy after she left the Giggling Gator. We weren't sure where they went. But we had some idea because the the investigators had found blood on the scene on Cedar Street. We hit every road and house in that neighborhood looking for video to see if we can see them. There's a lot of bed and breakfasts back there because there's some historic homes. If you had a B&B, you certainly would have had some security. One of the Airbnbs had a pretty good video surveillance system that had night vision that was pointed pretty much directly in the area where the blood was located. We were like, how did we get so lucky? Investigators immediately begin reviewing the footage, hoping it will show what happened to Jordy on the night of April 9th. It's very time consuming because you're watching the video frame by frame, minute by minute, at the same time as it's actually live. You don't want to speed through it because you can miss something. Though the footage is grainy, they spot two individuals walking down Cedar Street at nearly 3 a.m., shortly after Jordy left the Giggling Gator. When we picked them up on video, that third subject was no longer with them, and it would just appear to be Jordy and this large white male with tattoos on Cedar Street. Two people got to one spot. You can clearly see them walking down the street. You're like, okay, this is going to get me somewhere good. We're getting closer to it, finding out what happened on Cedar Street. They're talking, and then at one point, they were walking down into more shadows across the street where we located the blood. And now they look agitated. They look upset. They look um, like they're arguing. The headlights of an oncoming car illuminate what happens next. You see what appears to be a upward motion with the male's hands as if he's stabbing the female. And the next thing you see is she's on the ground and he's dragging her body into the driveway. We had no clue that that's what we were going to recover, that it was going to actually be a video of her being stabbed and then tossed over the fence, and we were just shocked.
Detectives in St. Augustine, Florida have uncovered home security video that captures Jordy Hudson's horrific final moments. I watched that video and you can see him pick her up and throw her on the ground several times. And then finally, at one point, he picks her up and throws her over a little white picket fence and just walks away like nothing had happened. The difficult part was there's no ifs, ands, or buts in my mind. Uh, I was watching Jordy get murdered. The police, they came and said Jordy had been murdered. That, that'll hit you hard. You'll stand back and look at it. I can't imagine it. It's, it's shocking. I felt sad about her, you know, losing her, knowing that I'm probably one of the last people to talk to Jordy. It made me think, okay, this is the last place she was at. What happened to her, you know, could I had like maybe five more minutes of conversation? Could I had changed the whole night? That runs through my mind, like, what could I have done for this been prevented? Well, everybody was shocked that that could happen here. We were just horrified trying to figure out how something like this could happen, especially to somebody, you know, like, like Jordy. I mean, it's uh, unthinkable that that somebody could do that to somebody that's so vulnerable. Now I need to do everything in my power to find where she is so I can at least give her mom that closure that she needs to be able to bury her daughter. Despite the poor quality of the video, police are able to determine the man who killed Jordy is the same tattooed man who was seen leaving the bar with her. He had a very distinct tattoo of a cross, and you can barely see it because, again, the quality of the video is not good, but it was good enough that you could see that tattoo on Cedar Street, and it matched the tattoo that he had in the, from the Giggling Gator. Detectives have only been able to identify the suspect as Harry and have no way to track him down. They turn back to the surveillance to see if they've missed anything. At about 6.30 in the morning, we see a car pull up directly in front of 88 Cedar Street, and the back door opens up. Two people exit the vehicle. Detectives recognize the first as Harry, but they can't identify the woman who is with him. We could tell that the female that was with him was very short. She did not appear to be taller than the car. You can tell that she's acting as the lookout. You can see Harry lift up what we believe was Jordy over the fence and put her in the back seat of the car. He gets back in the driver's seat, the female with him gets back in the passenger seat, and they drive off heading eastbound on Cedar Street. When the car leaves, as it drives by, you're doing everything you can to maybe get some identifiers to the vehicle. We could tell from the video that it was either dark blue in color, possibly black. As they're watching the video, one of the detectives states he believes the car is a Nissan Versa. We were like, there's no way. Like, we can't figure that out just by a video. And he was like, I'm telling you right now, I recognize the taillights and the headlights. It's going to be that car. If they can identify the owner of the vehicle, it could lead them to Harry. I'm trying to go frame by frame and get any information and get that tag number. We had a couple more tools in place that could enhance video, help us get that tag number. One of the guys that works there, he's great with video. He can do some stuff with video that's amazing. We aren't lucky enough. We were able to identify that tag number. At that point, they were able to identify a last name of somebody that owned vehicle matching that description. We were able to pull up the license tag. The vehicle comes back to a woman named Judith Branson. A quick search reveals she has a son named Harry. 
Investigators now have their suspect's full name. Harry Branson. After we got the last name Branson, we were able to pull Harry's police record. And fortunately for us, when somebody goes to jail, they take pictures of all their tattoos. And the one tattoo that stood out with Harry's police record was a very big cross on the front of his chest and his skull tattoos on his head. From the size, the height, the weight, everything else with the tattoos, he was easily identifiable. Now, knowing his name, there actually is a way we can find him. St. Augustine police identify Harry Branson as the suspect in the murder of Jordy Hudson. They can't find him, but they do get hold of his mother, Judith. She told us she knew nothing of what had occurred. She had woken up the next morning and her car was where it was supposed to be and she had gone to work. And all of us believed she didn't know what her son had done. Miss Branson wasn't aware that he had taken her car. And at first she's like, no, that's not him. Because we showed her a picture of him. The large tattoos all over his body and the head tattoos. And eventually she's like, yeah, that's my son, Harry. And she agreed to let us go through her car to see if we could find any evidence. We opened up the doors and we saw a lot of reddish brown stain that appeared to be blood. At that point, we sealed the car up and that was transported to the evidence text to go through and see if we can find anything. At that point, Branson knew we were on to him. He found out the police were talking to his mother, and he ran. Detectives believe their best lead to Harry may be the woman seen in the surveillance video with him, but they still have not been able to identify her. We started looking for females that he could be associated with. They discover police recently responded to a domestic dispute at Branson's residence. The victim in the report is his girlfriend, Christine Thomas. We discovered that Christine Thomas was very short. She was like 4'11", and she matches the height description when she was standing next to the car. So Christine's brought in for an interview. And your name? Christine. Christine. Do you know who I'm talking about when I say Harry? Harry Branson. Yeah. We have had an on-again, off-again relationship since I got here in January. Have you ever been to Cedar Street here in town? Do you know where Cedar I Street is? No. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that we have several videos from Cedar Street or Friday night into Saturday morning with a female that looks very similar. It's you. Okay. I want to know why I have you at Cedar Street on film. I don't even know where Cedar Street is. She definitely is not being cooperative. There were quite a few questions that she totally lied. That video shows you and Harry, okay, on Cedar Street. And I don't know what you're talking about. I I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm about. telling you, Saturday morning, we have several, several surveillance cameras. It's having to be pulled out of her instead of telling the truth. This is Jordy. Yeah, because I've never seen the lady in my life. It was when we showed her the picture of the Versa and her standing there next to it on the passenger side is when she realized that, you know, we knew what we were talking about and that she needed to fess up. Would you share with me what the first thing out of your mouth was when he called you? Oh, f 
So you said to him, what the fuck happened? What did he tell you? Harry said, hey, we need to go check this girl I got into a fight with. She tried to rob me, so they drove down to Cedar Street where the incident occurred. All of a sudden, she pulled a knife on her. Well, pulled a knife on? On Harry. On Harry, okay, okay. So I get, he either went like that and pushed her or whatever, and I guess she flew over a fence. Branson put Jordy's body in the back seat of their car. They drove out to County Road 13, and he ended up burying her body. On April 19th, 10 days after Jordy Hudson's final moments were caught on video, detectives arrest Christine Thomas. That same day, they finally tracked down Harry Branson. Branson had been on the run. He was hiding maybe a half a mile away in a little creek behind some people's houses. Lucky for us, we were able to get the U.S. Marshals involved, and they were able to get him in custody. On the way back to the station, Branson says he wants to talk. What happened? I about got in a fight at the Giggling Gator. Mm-hmm. And people I was with took cabs and left. As an investigator, one of the greatest things that we can do with a suspect is let them talk. So instead of interrupting him, we let him tell his whole story because eventually the evidence is going to prove otherwise. It was the girl and some guy. They said they was going to give me a ride home. Okay. But we had to walk back to the neighborhood to go get the car. Mm-hmm. And next thing I know, we walk around the corner and both of them pull out knives on me. Started saying, it's going to be your pockets. He stated that to protect himself, he ended up killing her. He was scared. He was frightened. He didn't mean to do it. The guy, all ass. Okay. He just dipped out. After Branson was completely finished with the story, the decision was made that we would let him know we had video surveillance. Once I told him we had video surveillance of the whole crime, he put his head down, closed his eyes, and sat there for a little bit. And then after a couple of minutes of sitting there, he looked up and said, okay, I'll tell you the whole story. On April 19th, 2016, 10 days after Jordy Hudson was last seen alive, St. Augustine police arrest Harry Branson for her murder. Branson originally claimed he killed Jordy in self-defense, but now he says he's ready to tell the truth about what happened. We have the whole thing on video. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity to be 100% truthful with us. Branson told us that they had left the bar, that they had been hanging out and talking, and at some point, Jordy said something to make him mad. I don't even know what really what she had said, but I snapped. I completely lost it, and I don't know why or how. He punched her in the face. And his story was that at that time, Jordy pulled the steak knife from her purse and tried to attack him. She swung the knife at me, and I grabbed her hand and shoved it back at her mm -hmm. and, and stabbed her in her throat. She was much smaller than him, so if he was trying to attack her, I don't know that that is wrong of her to pull a knife. She may have pulled a knife, but you can't tell that from the video. After his interview and him eventually telling us what had occurred, he agreed that he would give us the location of the body so that we could put Jordy to final rest. 
Branson leads police to his property in a rural part of the county. When you go up and you turn into the yard, there's a fire pit right over there. Under the fire pit. Did you burn her? No. No. I buried her. I freaked out. I didn't know what to do. He told us that he had started a bonfire afterwards so that nobody would see where he had just recently dug up the ground. All right, so she's buried right there? Yeah. We had the evidence technicians from the sheriff's office start coming out, and we started excavating the fire pit. Ultimately, we located Jordy Hudson. She was wrapped up in a shower curtain in the hole about three feet down. Her injuries are consistent with what Branson described in his confession. But there's an additional grisly detail he failed to mention. Apparently, he cut off her fingers to remove the rings. It was unknown if that was a robbery or just an attempt to remove rings that might have helped identify her. What really gets me is that one of those cut-off fingers was shoved into one of Jordy's neck wounds. When the results of lab tests on Branson's mother's car come in, They strengthen the case. The blood is matched to Jordy Hudson. Officials say Branson has been charged with murder and Thomas has also been charged with accessory to murder. Branson faces a mandatory life sentence for the murder of Jordy Hudson. But in a bid to avoid life behind bars, he pleads guilty to second degree murder and abuse of a dead human body. Branson is a very violent subject. He would not say why why he did it. He refused to tell us what exactly she said that made him mad. Without the video, this crime may never have been solved. We may still be here today trying to find out where Jordy's at. On May 30th, 2017, 13 months after the murder, Harry Branson is sentenced to 50 years in prison. For her involvement in the crime, Christine Thomas pleads guilty to accessory to second-degree murder, and is sentenced to eight years in prison. The way she passed, that's just, nobody deserves what happened to her. That's not normal. Makes you think like what you could have done or what would, you know, could you say something else? It weighs heavy on you. It's something I'll never forget. To create art seemed like such a natural part of her. She was just larger than life. I regret not acquiring a piece of Jory's art. She was one of the true originals. I just never expected for her to die because then it's like the creativity stops, you know. 